Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Peter for the PCPLD Network Steering Group. Welcome to the webinar. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Patricia Charlesworth, and I'm from uh, part of the uh, I'll have to say the National Network because I, don't, I can't say P. What is it? P PCPLD. P PCLD uh, Network. It's so lovely seeing all of you, uh, uh, and I hope you enjoy the time we spend with you. Um. I miss, I miss, um, having a, a meeting still, let me come together physical. But we're positive, because, because we have these platforms, it, it, whether it be Microsoft Teams or Zooms, we still meet virtually. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Pat and Peter, for that really warm welcome. Never mind about the hiccups. You never know what goes wrong in a thing like this. And hello, everyone. I'm Irene Tafrivaina, and I am, or I was until an hour ago, the chair of the Palliative Care for People with Learning Disabilities Network. Now, this is our first ever webinar. We were meant to meet in Cardiff at a conference today. Um, we're completely overwhelmed by the sign up for this. More than 2,000 people have signed up, more than 2,000 of you who are interested in making sure that people with learning disabilities get the right care in the right place at the right time at the end of their lives. So that's amazing, isn't it? Um, so whether you're a professional or a family member or a person with a learning disability, whoever you are, wherever you are in the world, you're really, really welcome. Now, we're in the PCPLD network, we talk about death and dying, and we wanted to start this webinar by really acknowledging how difficult this year has been for so many of us. It's the reason we're meeting online is because of COVID-19. And I'm very much aware that lots of people, um, lots of people watching this, lots of you will know people who've died this year, um, of, of, whether it's of coronavirus or something else. And you know, that may be people you've cared for, people you miss. So we wanted to start this webinar um, by, by just by acknowledging that and remembering them. So we're going to just start with just maybe a half a minute of silence um, to think and remember the people who've, who've died in the past year, whether they had learning disabilities or not, let's remember them. Thank you for joining us in that. So um, we are a network and a network is about connecting. And so I really hope that today you will make some connections with the issues and with each other. But let me start by saying something first about terminology, um, because I'm aware that some of you are not based in the UK. Here in the UK, we use the term learning disabilities. Um, but it can be quite confusing in other countries. You may be more familiar with intellectual disabilities used in most part of the world. Or if in the USA, you might know it as IDD, Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. But in this webinar, we'll use people with learning disabilities to mean the same thing. But of course, people are people first. Now, the topic of this webinar is being prepared for the end of life of people with learning disabilities. 
And here's the running order. And I am just so delighted and honoured to have the company of two outstanding keynote speakers, Dr. Catherine Mannix and Baroness Elora Finlay. Baroness Finlay is with us today, um, but she, she's recorded her talk because, um, it, you know, she's in Parliament. You never know what goes on in Parliament. She might not be able to make it. So, but in addition to talking about dying, we wanted again, as I said earlier, to acknowledge the huge impact of COVID-19 um, on all of our lives. So we've asked six people with learning disabilities, you know, what has this year, what has COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic been like for you? What's been difficult and has anything been good about it? So with most of them, we, we had a conversation on Zoom, which we recorded. So throughout the webinar, we will share with you those two minute videos. And I also want to spend just a bit of time at the end talking about the PCPLD network and who we are and what we do. And then we will end on a positive note, quite literally, and I will promise you it really is worth staying to the very end um, of, of this web webinar. webinar. Now, throughout the webinar, you can use the Q&A box to ask questions and to share your thoughts and resources with each other. I would, I know it's not a very nice thing to say, but it would be, because there's so many of you, we're talking, you know, a few thousand, um, maybe if you just stick to your comments and questions rather than introducing yourself, however lovely that might be, we might be quite swamped. And behind the scenes is Louise, who is monitoring your questions and comments and publishing them. So we hope to have some time at the end of all the talks to answer some of those questions. If you're on Twitter, Gemma will be live tweeting. Um, so we, we encourage you to tweet throughout this webinar using um, hashtag PCPLD2020. And thank goodness we've got Anastasia and Oksana behind the scenes. I can't tell you how complicated this has been to, to set all this up. Um, we haven't used this platform before, um, so we're really, really hoping it's all going to work. I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, so there's a lot to pack in to just an hour and a half. Um, so let's just get started. Uh, and I'm going to um, hand over first to Gavin, who is our very first um, speaker with experience. Hello, my name is Gavin Halcroft. I'm here today to talk about lockdown and my experiences. Some of my experiences have been great and fun during lockdown. Some have been quite stressful and others have been quite hard and sad. Another thing though, which was hard and quite sad was I lost two uh, two people through lockdown. One was a colleague who I'd know, who I'd worked with and known very well. She passed away sadly through the beginning of lockdown. And another was a very close childhood friend who died just recently. Having that happen in this time when mental health services aren't aren't the same as they usually are can be quite difficult but I'm hoping to get through that just the same I think lockdown has been a massive experience through lots of things through the stressful and the hard and also the sad times but the, one of the best things I think about lockdown is that we still have got our friends our loved ones and I've also had my wife Naomi and my dog Alfie who you just saw a minute ago Taking Alfie for a walk was something which really helped me get through lockdown. Alfie, come here, boy. Come here, boy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you, Gavin. And how lovely to see Alfie too. Thank you for introducing him to us as well. Now, it's a huge pleasure, pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Catherine Mannix. Um, Dr. Mannix is a palliative care consultant who's helped thousands of people at the very end of their lives. And she has seen the harm done by the taboo of death by not talking about it. And she's on a mission to reclaim public understanding of dying. And to do this, she has written what I think is one of the most moving and powerful books that I've ever read, With the End in Mind in which she tells the stories of some of her patients and their families. She says she's retired, but she seems to me busier than ever, going, giving talks and interviews, and she's helping people all over the world to be less afraid of dying by talking about it. So Catherine, thank you so much for joining us and over to you. Thank you, Irena, thank you very much. And hello, everybody. So lovely to meet you all. 
I hope everybody can hear me properly. I can see Arena who can nod if I'm actually got audio. Marvellous. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be with you all and so many of you. I know that we're never going to be best buddies with death, but I wanted to talk briefly about how knowing more can help us to be less frightened. And my slides are not advancing despite having, oh, here we go. So let's think about why we should talk about dying. Well, why do we avoid it? People don't like us to talk about it, do they? They say, can't we change the subject, talk about something nicer, do it later? And um, because we don't talk about it, it suggests that it's terrible, that it's scary, that it's too awful for us to talk about. And yet we know that for anything that's scary, the more we understand about it, the less there is to be fearful about. And the more confident we feel, the more we look confident, we move confident, we speak confident, and that makes everybody around us feel more confident as well. We also know that complicated things need a lot of thinking about. We do a lot of preparation before we go away on holiday, before we take somebody for the first time to dentists. So this is a complicated thing. It needs some thinking about in advance and that helps us to be able to deal with it when it's happening. So thinking about where to start, well, we start where we always start. Human beings tell each other stories. We all do that. And so it might be that we're using stories in books or it might be things that come up on the news. It might be that we've got a relative or a friend or there's a pop star who's poorly or who dies, or it might be somebody's pet. We know that talking about dying won't make it happen, just as talking about winning the lottery still hasn't made me win the lottery. It's completely safe to talk about dying. Sometimes a person might get a new diagnosis or have a medical problem and that makes it even more important to start to think about these things. And when we do that, it's important to keep a record of that conversation so that if somebody else is going to come and pick up the conversation, they know the words that we used and how the person that we were talking to understood it and the words that they used. So for that person, it might be that you're going to use a little notebook. It might be that you use one of the brilliant books beyond words that all three of us are going to say great things about today. And for carers, um, whether you're a, a, a lay person of family or whether you're a professional, write it down so that anybody else who needs to pick up from you can do that. I'm going to show you just some um, extracts from the books beyond words that are about dying and there are some new books now that are about COVID as well but you can see these beautiful illustrations the words in these books are the words that come out of your mouth as you have a conversation about the pictures and when you've had those conversations you can make notes in the book if you want to so the next person who has that conversation with the person with learning disability knows what you talked about last time and can use the same sorts of words what we need to be talking about to be ready for dying is about what really matters to an individual person. And we know that that might be people or we, know we, we just met Alfie, Gavin's lovely dog. It might be the place that people live or it might be the things around them that just make them feel safe and able to deal with difficult things. Some people like to have their own space for peace and quiet. Some people like to have their own space to have company and fun. And we don't need to be talking about dying to understand what the things are that are important to people. We can talk about holidays. When I go away from home, what do I like to have with me that makes me feel safe and secure? We can talk about going for an overnight stay somewhere. If I was going to go and visit somebody in my family or somebody I was very excited to see, but it's too far away to get home the same day, what would I take with me to make me feel safe and secure while I was away overnight? And then we can start to talk about, say I had to be in hospital rather than on holiday. Would it be those same things? Would there be anything extra? And how do I stay in touch with people? Hasn't this been important during COVID? So how do we stay in touch? Is it by telephone? Is it by mobile phone? If this is somebody who uses one of the sign languages, then video messaging is a really important thing for them. Maybe it's somebody who uses text messages or who has an assistant who provides text messaging for them. Really important to be able to contact people when they're not nearby. I want to say briefly what to expect 
when somebody's dying because there's a great mystery around it and when you see it on television it's always extremely extreme and it's exciting and it's terrifying and it's just not like that at all as we're dying generally what happens is we get more tired and we need regular naps so carers need to encourage napping and explain to friends and family that napping is important and then with the little bit of energy that people have between their naps let's use that for the thing that's most helpful or most enjoyable rather than doing insisting on the usual rules like walking to the dining room maybe you can get wheeled to the dining room give us a break and then you can enjoy eating your meal instead people may have less appetite and maybe what we need to do is stop trying to insist on big meals and just offer tiny tastes of the things they really love of course if they lose appetite altogether we need to check that they're not feeling nauseated and i know professor elora is going to say something about that in a moment as time goes by people change from being um sleepy to actually being unconscious with periods of being awake but this now means that we can't wake them up when it's medicine time and of course if they've got symptoms from their illness breathlessness itch nausea pain think of the, the symptoms we might get from illnesses we need to make sure that those symptoms don't come back if they're not awake enough to take their medicines so we might need now to start to use a different way of giving those medicines we need to explain this pattern of changing awakeness and being unconscious to family and friends so they don't worry that something wrong is happening. This is the normal pattern. This is safe and right. But we all know that we've had that experience of being awake first thing in the morning and we're not quite awake yet. And we feel a little bit muddled about what happened in the dream and what's happening in real life. That can happen now as well and people can be a little bit muddled and we might need to help them to recognise who we are. So just shouting, it's me, it's me, doesn't really help. We do have to say, hello, it's Dr Catherine and take my mask down for a moment so you can see my face and put it back up again. Oh, hello, it's mum. Remember how much expression we can get into our eyes when we're talking to people. We need to look for signs of people being distressed, but we also need to look for signs of people being contented. And this is really important. We want people to feel contented and we need to pass on what contentment looks like to other carers who might be new to this very important patient that they're looking after. So for example, I have friends with learning disability who when they're distressed, they rock. But I also have a friend with a learning disability who when she's happy, she rocks and she sings to herself. So it's really important that people know that rocking is a distress sign for some people, but it's a contentment sign for somebody else. So for this person, how do we know when they're contented is a really important part of the message for people who are looking after them. We move on from being unconscious some of the time to being unconscious all of the time. The person doesn't know they're becoming unconscious. It doesn't cause them to be frightened. Once we're completely unconscious, our breathing starts to change and it becomes just reflex breathing patterns. We don't know we're doing it, but sometimes the breathing is fast and then it becomes slow and then fast again. Sometimes it's deep and then it's shallow and then it's deep again. Sometimes it's pretty noisy and snorry and it's important to explain to families that this is OK. This is all normal and it doesn't mean that the person is distressed. Everything's starting to shut down in this person's body. Their blood pressure isn't as high and so their body starts to be a little bit cooler their skin might be paler cool to touch their fingernails and toenails may go a little bit dusky they might get a little bit restless and we need to check that that doesn't mean they're uncomfortable and deeply unconscious people are very relaxed their face muscles relax all those wrinkles start to fall away we look younger when we're unconscious surprisingly but our mouth might flop open. So if somebody's mouth, they're lying with their mouth open, their friends might think that's a bit peculiar and that needs to be explained. The person's just very deeply relaxed. And then during one of these periods of slow breathing, there'll be a breath out that just doesn't have another breath afterwards. That last breath isn't special, it isn't difficult, it isn't panicky, it's very, very gentle. And it's fine for carers to encourage family and friends to sit with a dying person and to continue to sit with them after they've died, always explaining as we're caring what's going on, we need to keep talking. There's some evidence that unconscious people can still hear us, so let's make sure they hear the voices of people that they love and the sounds that they enjoy, maybe their favourite music. 
for carers, let's explain what's happening as we're giving the care. Tell people what to expect next in this process and keep checking, keep asking. Remember those things that were important, what matters most to the person that we talked about at the beginning. Now this really matters. If the cat needs to be in the room, find the cat. We all know the cat will decide whether it's going to be in the room or not, right? But these are important things. Is the right music playing? Is the person in the right place? Are there the right people around them? Families don't know what to do, so give them jobs that help them stay connected. Maybe they can help the person not to have very dry lips by rubbing lip salve in or using um, something to help their mouth not to get too dry if they're breathing through their mouth or rubbing cream into their arms and legs to help them feel loved and cared for or making teas and coffees and keeping everybody with enough drinks going on. We're checking all the time for the person's comfort, for their level of awareness and if they need communication aids we have to really bear those in mind. Deaf people need to wear their hearing aids while they're dying or they can't hear the reassurance of our voices. But we need to remember when we're lying them on their side, not to, to take the hearing aid out so that it doesn't press in from the pillow. So these aren't complicated medical things. This is care that can happen at home. Now, they may very well need little bits of medical care, but dying itself doesn't cause complicated symptoms. It only causes tiredness and unconsciousness and automatic breathing. The symptoms a person has are from either the illness that they have or just because they're not moving about, they're lying still in bed all the time and their joints get a bit stiff and creaky. So we need a plan for managing any symptoms and your district nurse or your general practitioner or a palliative care team, they'll all help with this. And it might mean storing drugs and equipment and things somewhere that's really safe in the place where the person lives. And the plan needs to tell us what to do. If this person gets a symptom, what should our action be? When should we send for help? Who should we ask for help? And also instructions in the plan in case you need to call somebody out of hours who doesn't know this person as a patient, who needs to know what they like to be called, how they like to be spoken to, what sorts of language they like to use and what, is, what matters to them. So that for a person who really doesn't want to go to hospital, people who come in to help understand that. So I'm about to finish. I want to just get a message across that dying is just a normal part of living. And although it might make us sad, it needn't make us frightened. People with learning disabilities, they just die the same as anybody else is dying. And it's something we can talk about. It's a process we can recognise. It's something we can get ready for. And that means that mostly we can help people to be cared for in surroundings that they know with the right people around them. Or if they do need to go to hospital, we know what are the things that they need to have around them to keep them feeling secure. This webinar is because it's time to talk about dying. And I'm going to finish by just wishing you all the best of luck with these really important and beautiful conversations. Good luck, everyone. Oh, Catherine, thank you so much. And just what an, what an extraordinary start to this webinar, don't you all think? And I mean, just all the things you're saying, Catherine, is just so true. I have just noticed again and again that so many, so much of the distress and the difficulties come from people not being familiar and not understanding and not knowing what dying is like. Um, so I think if, if you are listening to this and you are somebody who um, works in palliative care or works, you know, who, who has seen people die, then please know how much you need to explain that, as Catherine said, to and, and help people, families, supporters, care, care staff in learning disability services, just to sort of know that it's OK. Um, you know, it, it's OK. I think that's 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 the main uh, message. This is what happens and, and that is how it happens. So thank you, Catherine. For, and I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about that. But before we um, go to the next speaker, I want just to introduce you to Richard, who is our next um, speaker with experience. You may actually have seen him already on Twitter or YouTube because he's um, he's on the trailer for this webinar. So let's listen to Richard. A few new I did, and but uh, um, we had to watch it on the computer by Zoom. 
and it's quite difficult it was because the, the, you can be at the funeral uh, but you can be, uh, I felt like I wanted to go through the computing to give the lady the, 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 the lady a hug I did because that uh, I knew and all that you know I just wanted to to, to go and give her a hug just just sitting there on just for her and her daughter, yes, it's quite emotional not being able to go to a funeral and to be able to be there and to give to give your friend a hug, that's it, yes. People who don't always used to get a telephone call, and I have been getting a telephone call, or an extra telephone call, just to see how they are and all that, yes. So it's been, I think it's brought people a bit closer and fit them. It's been nice to be able to walk outside and look up at the sky and you know see a clear sky and you know, be able to see the moon, the moon and you know hear the birds sing and all that. Just, so that's been quite nice about it. Not so much pollution in the air, yes. And people making time for one another, yes. Oh, thank you, Richard. That is such a moving experience you've shared with us there. So thank you. I'm sure there must be people out there who have very similar, really painful, difficult experiences of funerals. And so thank you for you know, just, just sharing how that, how, what that was like. I think the image of wanting to reach through the screen is going to stay with me, really. Um, so for our next talk, um, I'm delighted and honoured to introduce Baroness Ilora Finlay. Baroness Finlay is a professor of palliative medicine at Cardiff University and she's a past president of the Royal Society of Medicine. She's been an independent crossbench member of the House of Lords for almost 20 years. Baroness Finlay has worked tirelessly both in practice and in Parliament to guarantee good care for people at the end of life. She's introduced debates and she championed policy forum and she's been a hugely supportive of our work with people with learning disabilities so i'm really so very pleased she can share some of her vast knowledge with us today and as i said earlier baroness finlay she's got an unpredictable and quite busy schedule in parliament we didn't want to risk having her to drop out um, so we recorded her talk and her slides a few days ago and just to remind you also um, that this afterwards but let's watch and listen to um Thank you so much for inviting me to present here today at your really important conference. I'm going to talk to you about being prepared for the end of life and talking about dying, making sure there isn't something that's reversible, a bit about symptom control signals, staying and at home and looking after someone who's dying at home and some of the difficult decisions that we have to make. Are there some golden rules here? Yes, go at the pace of the person. Answer all questions honestly, calmly and simply. Don't talk to them about going to sleep or going to heaven. Be quite clear and honest and gentle. People become weaker and tired. They gently become unconscious and when deeply unconscious, their heart stops and they slipped out of life. That's it. If you talk about going to sleep, the poor person will get frightened of going to bed. What about caring for somebody at home, particularly somebody with COVID? There's guidance that I've written and it's on the Hospice UK website. It's also on the Bevan Commission website and the link at the top of this slide is the link to this page. And I've gone through here deciding to be at home 
some of the things that you need to think about in planning, things that will arise, how you can tell when somebody's really dying, dying near the end, how you can tell if somebody's dead and what to do when they've died. But what are some of the symptoms that might arise or signs that there's a problem? Signs of distress or if the person you can't communicate perhaps becomes agitated or they're not moving, they're moving less or they're just grimacing, their facial expression isn't as it normally is or they're rocking or humming, making different noises or that they resist touch, they lash out, they push you away. It may be that they're in pain somewhere, but they have difficulty localising it. What about the person who's not eating? Well, it's often a sign of nausea and there may be a reversible cause to the nausea. So don't just think, oh, they've lost their appetite. It may be that they've got something going on, like a urinary tract infection that's making them feel sick. So think about all the causes of nausea and exclude those and then deal with the problem. But what has COVID taught us? Well, the old rules have gone. We're in a time of change. Just be person focused. Don't worry about the old rules. Their oxygen levels, they drop their saturations, but they don't look as if they've lost, lost oxygen transport. So you must do their SATs because actually otherwise they get critical and they'll just die in front of you and they may need oxygen. Visiting, don't stick just with policies. Have relatives have COVID? If they have, they're not going to get it again probably. And are there young people in the family who even if they did get it, they're at low risk and who really want to be the person who visits, perhaps a sibling who's got learning difficulties or an older person. What about vitamin D? People who've been indoors all the time or a lot often are vitamin D deficient. The jury's out as to whether it makes any difference, but it might help them prevent them getting the infections so badly in the first place. No point giving it when they're ill. I is for infection control, like any infection, hand washing, masks, keeping your distance. Those are really important. They're the basic principles of infection control. And the D is for do it. Do the right thing for the person. Don't worry about the rules and the policies and the bits and the pieces. The policies are there to keep people safe. They're not to make things harder for people or put them at greater risk of a problem. Listen to what your heart tells you. What can you plan? Well, try to think of every eventuality. Make sure that you've got medication there just in case, a just in case box of things at the weekend or at night that might arise and that you've got medication there. Above all, listen. Listen to the person and those who know the person. And if you can, look at an advanced care plan. And I want to say a bit about advanced care plans because just like birth plans, whatever you plan for usually doesn't happen. So what if you can't follow someone in someone's end of life plan and their wishes during this time? This picture is courtesy of Books Beyond Words. What is a care plan? Well, it's an advanced statement of wishes. It is not legally binding. You have to revisit it when it's to be used and referred to because it might no longer be relevant. The person may have changed their mind, but it can be a very, very useful document to inform best interest decision making if you have to take a decision on behalf of the person if they can't take it themselves. What about a best interest decision? Well, whoever is looking after the person at the time that the decision has to be made is the person who takes the best interest decision. Of course, you might be able to delay the decision either till the person regains capacity or somebody more senior comes, but actually it's usually whoever's there. And it is that the person lacks capacity for that decision at that time. 
so they may have capacity for some decisions, but not for others. You must never be motivated to bring about their death. And you must consult widely the family and those who know the person's wishes and feelings. It might be carers, it might be their friends. Again, listen, listen, listen. And think, is there a lasting power of attorney or a court appointed deputy or similar? Someone empowered in law to take health and welfare decisions. The title of those people varies from country to country, but there is a general principle about the law sometimes putting somebody in charge of decisions for those who can't take them themselves. But whatever decision is taken, it must be in the person's interests, not in the interests of others. It cannot be because it suits other people. It must be focused around the person and only them. And involve them as much as you can, even if they don't have capacity. Still tell them what you're doing, why you're doing it, them, and consult with them on the little things. You really cannot and must not have blanket policies. And things like the phrase DNAR, please never use it. DNR, do not resuscitate or do not attempt resuscitation. No, that is illegal. You must treat people. They must have all care. Just because somebody thinks that they lack capacity doesn't mean they get less care. But there are difficult decisions that you might have to take. For example, testing. You might be testing for COVID to see if the person is symptomatic. If, if they are symptomatic, it would be part of their treatment. And therefore, it's sensible to proceed because if they have COVID, the way that you'll manage them will be different to if they don't have COVID, accounting for whatever their temperature, their cough, their vomiting or whatever. But if testing is because there's a blanket policy in the institution to screen everybody and the person is resisting, then you don't have any right to hold them down and force testing on them. You have to think, why are you doing it? What are the risks? Another difficult decision, transfer to hospital. Know what the policy is about visiting and on balance, are they better off staying where they are with people coming in? Remember about oxygen, of course, as well. The decision do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation or DNA CPR is very specific. It only applies if their heart stops and all care must be given, including other life prolonging, such as putting them on a ventilator or using CPAP or other life-saving care, giving fluids, antibiotics, with COVID, giving dexamethasone and so on. But above all, what's the golden rule if there is one? It's to listen. Listen, listen, listen. This is the Chinese symbol for listening. You don't just listen with your ears. You listen with your eyes and you must be kind. Let the person see from your eyes that you are being kind. Because if you're behind a mask, the one thing they will see are your eyes. And give them your undivided attention. Look at them, stay calm, move gently. And let your voice show that you are really doing things from the heart and that your heart is behind the care that you're giving. And listen to your heart. Listen to what your inner heart is telling you and use your mind, the green bit, to integrate everything that you're obtaining to make sure you're doing best by the person. So I've said to you, integrate all of your skills. Listen and listen to that inner voice within yourself. Because if you do, and you're gentle and you're kind, you will provide care that enhances somebody's dignity. They may recover, that would be great. But if they don't, you will have cared for them gently and in a dignified way as they're dying. And you will have done all you can to meet their wishes. 
and thank you for listening and inviting me. And as I said, as I put on my lanyard, my distance aware lanyard, keep your distance. Those of you that want to use distance aware, you want a, a lanyard or a button, I'll send the link to you as to how you can get one. But we all need to keep our distance, except when we're in close caring contact. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Elora. I don't know whether you've managed to, um, to actually attend this webinar live. If you are, just I'll tell, tell you that now. It's just wonderful to have your really helpful and enlightening talk. And I'm glad we managed to record that um, a, a couple of days ago. And just, you know, so good to be reminded of all the issues around mental capacity and best interest decisions for people who, uh, you know, who don't have capacity for particular decision making. But particularly, actually, I'm really struck by by sort of being reminded of the overriding importance of being kind um, and of listening to your heart, because I think even if even if people um, can't use or don't understand words, maybe particularly if they don't understand words, they can certainly understand your face, <laughs> your facial expressions, your emotions, your manner. Um, it's so important that we share that we are ourselves and that we share with, with loving care. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to move on to our next um, speaker with experience tell, telling us what lockdown has been like um, for, for them. And that's Vince. Over to you, Vince. I'll just I'll start by saying um, lockdown. I've got to be honest. Um, I haven't got a clue really what lockdown meant to, to me as a whole. I have no idea what lockdown meant. And obviously the virus was spreading, um, but I had no idea what actual lockdown meant until it actually started occurring. Obviously, when you suddenly have a very busy week. Um, to suddenly not doing anything at all because everything has closed down. Um, that was a big shock to the system. Um, it was like everything had just, uh, well, just stopped. It was like time had stopped and um, life had stopped. Um, and it was like, um, what now? You know, what, what am I going to do now? Everywhere's closed, everywhere's, well, in lockdown. The first couple of weeks for me personally were the toughest because um, all of a sudden uh, I had nothing to do. Um, so basically um, I had to learn to try and find myself um, new things to do really. <laughs> Luckily this um, Zoom app has become a regular part of life really and um, it's really out because you're still talking to people. I know it's not face to face sort of thing, but it's by screen, so you can, you know, you're still talking to people. So, although you're at home on your own, you're not so much on your own, if you know what I mean, because you, you become part of the conversation, although it is by screen and not actually by face to face sort of thing. Thank you so much, Vince. And, um, you know, of course, having prepared for this, I've watched all these video clips a couple of times and I'm just struck by different things each time. And this time for me, it was it was you saying life had stopped and I had to find myself. And isn't that true for so many of us that we, you know, that this, in this year that we really had to think about who we are and, 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 and you know, the people around us and find ourselves. So thank you for reminding us of that. So next, actually the next speaker up is myself, so I have to introduce myself now. Um, and for this talk, I'm going to wear my hat as, as Professor of Intellectual Disability and Palliative Care. I work at Kingston and St George's University in London. And I'm going to talk to you about end of life care planning for and with people with learning disabilities. We've already heard from, from Catherine and Elora lots of really useful things about that. But I'm going to stress some of these things again. It's so important because all too often 
I find that families and care staff are just sort of taken by surprise. So, you know, maybe somebody has gone into hospital with, a, with an infection, chest infection, and they take a turn for the worse, and they take another turn for the worse, and they die. And nobody seen it coming. And people, families and carers are left with just so many what ifs and if onlys. You know, they may look back and think actually, I'm not surprised that happened, but why didn't we see it coming? You know, questions, should we have had more aggressive treatment? You know, what happened here? What more could we have done? He should have died in his own bed at home and we weren't with him. So in the next 10 minutes, we will think about the kinds of things that can help everyone to be more prepared. And of course, as Baroness Finlay said, you know, things are probably not going to work out the way you've planned them. Um, or the way you hope, um, situations may arise that nobody had foreseen. And, and we've seen some really extreme examples of that, you know, with this year with COVID-19, utterly unforeseen circumstances that made it really difficult to provi provide the end of life care in the way people would have planned or wished for. Now, there's a lot of confusion about end of life care planning, and you may also have come across the term um, advanced care planning, and there are quite a few easy read templates available. If you are looking for one of those, um, then there are links to them on the resources page of the PCPLD network website. But I just want to say, just be careful using them. Um, it worries me a bit, to, you know, that some people might think, you know, here we are, I've got, I've got one of these, I'm done now. End of life care planning is never a tick box exercise. So don't ever use these as a, as a starting point or even as an end point. Um, this quote um, was a learning disability student nurse um, telling me about this and it alarms me hugely to hear that in, in this care home, everyone's end of life care plan looks the same. You know, that's not right. I mean, none of them should look the same. They're all very personal working document documents. So a lot of learning disability services are thinking about end of life care plans, but I found that that many of the things that I'm working with, what I'm doing is, is an emphasis on funerals. You know, do I want to be buried or cremated, planning the funeral? Do I want flowers? Now, these are, of course, really important questions, and it is absolutely right and proper that people with a learning disability, um, if they want to and if they can, are involved in thinking about those kind of things. And so by all means, do you know, do talk about it when the opportunity arises. Um, and Catherine has already um, you know, given some examples of when that might be, when there's um, death on the news or on the TV or somebody you know has died, for example. And by all means, you know, do write that down. But the funeral plan is really a, what happens after I die plan. Whereas end of life care planning is a what happens before I die plan. It's much more than that. So it's questions like, you know, what do I want and, and what do I really not want? Um, and what point does my comfort become more important than the length of my survival? At what point does my comfort become more important than the length of my survival? That's different for everybody. You know, they asked, answered that question. You know, what will make me feel most comfortable and most at peace when I'm ill and when I'm dying? What comforts me? What upsets me? Who will I want to have around me? And, and what are the things that make me feel at home? You know, lots of people will say if they could choose, I want to be at home, but it may not be possible. So it, it's, it's finding out what it is about being at home that is so important and, and essential to that person. You know, is it missing my things? Is it my routines that I want to be the same all the time? Or is it missing the people who know me and who love me? So see if you can try and have those things, even if you can't be at home, those people, those routines, you know, in hospital or wherever the person is transferred to. And what you need to know and what you need to write down, as, as Catherine has also said, is what matters most to this person. So end of life care planning is not so much a question of how do I want to die, but how do I want to live? You know, how do I want to live in my final hours, in my final days, in my final weeks or months? 
And it's really important to think about this together and to anticipate what might happen in the days, weeks, months ahead about somebody's health and health and energy. And that's best done together with the person, with people who know the person well, but also with sort of healthcare staff who know what to expect physically. So let's look at an example. So here's Anne, whose health is fading slowly. She's getting weaker and weaker. Now it's taken Anne years to become independent, right? And the staff don't want her to lose that. So they keep encouraging Anne to keep walking up the stairs. But nowadays, walking up the stairs takes Anne the best part of 15 minutes, right? She's now so frail though, that she each day she only has about two hours of energy. So Anne is not dying, but she does need people to help her make a plan. She needs the healthcare staff to explain to the carers that she will have less and less energy as the months go by, not more, but less. And so at what point is she going to stop using that little energy that she has to climb those stairs? You know, perhaps that time has come already. Perhaps she prefers to spend her little bit of energy on watching TV or visiting her sister. And it's now become your job, who's always helped her to walk and to do her own cooking. It's become your job to help her to move and to do her cooking for her. And if you don't discuss this together and write down what it is that Anne wants, then the danger is that a new staff member will come along and thinking they'll do the very best for her, um, you know, encouraging her to walk. But in doing so, what they're actually doing is depriving her of quality time with her sister because Anne will be too exhausted. So I'm going to hand over now to two members of our PCPLD Network Specialist Advisory Group who will tell us some of their experiences with end of life care planning. So first, Jean Wilson, whose daughter Victoria died seven years ago of the complications of tuberous sclerosis. Now, Jean's family had known for about two years that Victoria was going to die. They just didn't know when. And Victoria had profound and multiple learning disabilities. She lived nearby in her own flat, supported by a team of care staff and her family who lived close. Now, Victoria was unable to say what she wanted, but the people who loved her knew how much she hated hospital. So she wanted to be at home and die at home, even if that meant that her life was not prolonged. So do not under any circumstances take me to hospital was written in her advanced care plan. Then we have Louise Heatley, who is now retired, but she has decades of experience of supporting people with learning disabilities throughout their lives, including the end of their, her, their lives. And in this picture, she's um, with our mutual friend Michelle, not long before Michelle died last year. So I'm just going to um, hand over to them and see if we can get the videos up and listen to um, what they have to say about end of life care planning. On several occasions, Victoria was having um, huge seizures. So ambulances were called and, and um, she went in the ambulance to try and get the seizures under control. And on two occasions, there were support workers who really wanted her to go off to hospital because they could see how dangerous and painful this was for Victoria. Um, but the ambulance people knew from her uh, acute care plan that this was not an option. This is what was written and this is what was recorded. And this is what Victoria and her family wanted. <coughs> that she would go into hospital, they would treat her there. Um, and two, two support workers found that extremely difficult um, and told the team leader that they couldn't hack it really. So they were given an option of going elsewhere. Uh, do not resuscitate, they could not manage that because of their religious um, beliefs. Um, when they saw that written down, they said, uh, I, well, they didn't say it to me, they said it to the team leader. We would find that extremely difficult. If she reached that stage, we don't think we could follow it through. And because the team leader knew how strongly we felt, she came back and 
I said to her, uh, give them the other option. If they really feel strongly, then they can work in another house with somebody else. Um, because I wouldn't want to go against people's beliefs. Um, and it wouldn't be good for Victoria, and it certainly wouldn't be good for them. And I'd get extremely cross. I'm a member of the circle of support for um, a woman who, who I used to support directly for a number of years. And we've recently been thinking uh, with her and to a large extent on her behalf, because she's not easily able to, to verbalize or express these things, um, about what she would want at the end of her life. And she's not approaching the end of her life, but um, it's been planning both in order to make sort of funeral wishes and, and death wishes known, but also what she would want, or what, what she think she would want at the end of her life. And so we've looked at quite sort of specific things. Um, and we've written a plan and it includes uh, how she communicates and how she likes to be communicated with. Um, it includes what makes her upset what helps her when she's upset, what helps to calm her. Um, little things like her possessions. So she's very keen on her hair slides and uh, it would be really important in if as she approaches the end of her life that she'd always have her hair slides to hand um, and her money purse and her key and certain sort of things which, which they have a use and the use probably wouldn't be relevant anymore, but they would still be a security object for her. We're also thinking about who are the people or we've written down when we knew we didn't have to think about. We've written down uh, to be on the record of who, who are the people who are important in her life. Um, what would happen if, for example, she was taken suddenly ill? So we've named one person as her advocate and the family have agreed that this person could make medical decisions on her behalf if necessary. Um, but also if she were if she were ill or coming to the end of her life in a more gentle way, who would be the people that she would want to come and spend time with her? I think it was really important that as well as uh, on, on this woman's circle of support, as well as her family members, there are also support workers. And obviously you as support workers, you are the people who are most likely to know the person's everyday needs. So you'd know about the hair slides and the money purse and the keys and it may be that other people won't and it's really important that this is all recorded because you might move on you might be supporting somebody else and it may be that that somebody who is newer coming in they will take time to get that information but if you've written it down then they're going to have it and she's going to be much better supported So thank you, um, you know, Jean and Louise, and, and also thank you to Open Future Learning um, for letting me use those videos. Um, they were all filmed in my kitchen earlier this year, just before lockdown, thank goodness. And that was for an online training module for learning disability staff. And the training module is on end of life care. Um, it's almost ready. It's not quite available yet. It will be available from this month. So do have a look um, at the Open Future Learning um, site if you're interested in this kind of training for your staff. Um, lots of really good stories and lots of videos with, um, with, with Jean and Louise and some others, including Richard, actually, who spoke about funerals. He's also um, helped with that module. So Jean and Louise's stories just show us that end of life care planning can happen at all stages of people's lives. You know, you don't have to wait until people are dying. Victoria's family cleared, clearly they were helped to understand that she was nearing the end of her life and that prompted them to think about all the possible um, and the likely what if scenarios. But Louise's story shows that even when somebody's not ill or dying, um, it, it's a good idea to start thinking about and recording someone's priorities, somebody's wishes, somebody's comforts, because the unexpected will happen, right? And if the unexpected happens, if somebody suddenly is rushed into hospital with something that, you know, and that deteriorate quickly, it's likely that that person will then be unable to be fully involved in making decisions because they'll be ill and feeling unwell. 
So when the unexpected happens, you don't want a panic situation when nobody knows what decisions or choices would be best for that person who should be involved or what they would have wanted. So think about, you know, if what if, what you want to happen, what you don't want to happen, and who will speak for you if you can't speak for yourself. And those are the three cornerstones of end of life care planning. And having said that, you can do it at any time. There are particular situations that should prompt this, the discussion and the recording of end of life care plans and the changing of the plans you've already had in place. And these are, for example, when the person or their family starts the conversation or when the person has a new diagnosis like cancer or dementia or actually COVID-19. If there's a change or a deterioration in somebody's condition, or if the person has been hospitalized repeatedly, you know, perhaps they keep getting infections, they're in and out of hospital. The surprise question, that is, would you be surprised if this person died within the next 12 months? Now, they might not be terminally ill, but if your answer is, mm, no, I wouldn't be that surprised, actually, um, then you need to think about this together and talk and make a what if plan. Or if there's a change in circumstances, so for example, the person um, moves out of the parental home. And there are ways of doing this because, of course, that person might be young and fit. And the last thing you want is to jump on them with the question, you know, oh, how do you want to die? What sort of death do you want? So, you know, don't do it like that. These are really sensitive discussions. But perhaps you can ask them and ask their family something like, you know, oh, you're, you're really welcome here. We're so happy that you've moved into our home. You know, we hope that you can be with us and live here for a very long time. But, you know, if really the worst were to happen and you were to become very ill, for example, you know, who would you want us to contact? Who wants you to be able to talk about what it is that you want? Might you want to be back with your family when you're really ill? Those kind of things. You know, it's sensitive and think carefully, but don't completely ignore it either. And finally, I'm going to join the, the, the join the queue of people recommending books beyond words. Um, they produce pictures that help people with learning disabilities think and talk about difficult topics, and that includes death and dying. And all my pictures in this presentation come from books beyond words. So thank you to them for letting me use them. And one of the recent resources I've work, worked on with them is a guide for family and carers actually on planning ahead during coronavirus. It's a free resource that you can download as a PDF, how to support people with learning disabilities if someone dies during lockdown. And there's also a set of pictures that can be used during Zoom, on Zoom to help people with learning disabilities to talk about coronavirus. And it was actually Rich's experience you heard earlier about attending a funeral on Zoom that prompted us to um, include this picture, to create this picture and include it. So there's a lot more to say about this topic, of course, but I'm going to have to leave it there. I'm just looking at the time. I think my time's run out. If you're interested, there is a more detailed one hour webinar available on my own website. And the details are here and we'll see any links that you will see in this in this whole webinar. Um, we'll make sure that, that you'll get them, that they'll be available as well as the recording. So thank you so much for your attention and for um, uh, for, for listening and, and really help uh, help to think about these these really sensitive but important topics. And I'm going to stop speaking there and move um, move over hand over to our next speaker with experience, and that's Sam. So let's wait for Sam to appear on our screens. Hi everyone, my name is Sam Prouse. I'm an expert by experience advisor in Hertfordshire County Council in the Adult Disability Service. I'm going to share with you some of my experiences of the coronavirus and the lockdown during 2020. For me, uh, a lot of my routine and structure is gone, which is something I uh, work quite closely with and I, I really enjoy structure uh, and I know from speaking with other people with learning disabilities it's the same for them as well. It's been really tough. One of the toughest things that's happened is my granddad had a massive decline in his dementia and has gone into a care home and what was scary about that is 
when I first found out where he was going, I'd seen previously in the news that they had 20 people that had died of coronavirus there. So it was quite scary to know that. Um, it was just sad to see how he was declining. So at the beginning of lockdown, I was um, doing some shopping to support him and my grandma. Uh, so that's quite uh, quite tough. And you know, I was happy to do that. But when I went round, it was becoming a bit more emotional because you could see how granddad um, was becoming more unsteady uh, and didn't really recognise me as such. That was quite hard. Um, something that I think has been quite positive during lockdown is, although there's always that with my granddad, is that from my another bit of my family, my, my dad, my step and my siblings, um, we've we've been doing family quizzes and they've been great fun. Like a lot of people, I think the nation must be quizzed out. Um, and uh, we've been doing them in fancy dress. Um, so I dressed as Bugs Bunny the other week in my onesie. It was very comfortable. I stayed in there all day afterwards because it was really comfortable. I think that's something that we're hoping to continue after lockdown. Um, I think this hasn't been the nicest experience, but we will get through this and actually we will be stronger as people. Oh, oh, thank you, Sam, for sharing that experience. And I'm, I'm going to be stuck with an image of all of us dressed in our onesies now. Um, that, that would be really, really comfortable. So thank you. Um, I'm just going to hand over now to, I can see that there's lots and lots of questions are pouring into the to Q&A box. Um, and we've got about 10 min, min, minutes left now be, um, before I move on to the final bit, which is to explain about the PCPLD network. So I'm going to hand over to Louise, who behind the scenes has been monitoring all your questions and see um, if there's anything that's that either myself or Catherine um, would be able to answer. As I said, Elora is not with us as a live speaker, so any questions to her we'd have to, Catherine, you and I will have to deal with. Um, Louise, over to you. Sorry, I did the classic thing there that everyone's been doing. I didn't unmute myself. Sorry, um, just 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 to show I'm human. Um, the, it's really good to see all the the chat that's been going on. And one of the things that I think Catherine probably would be best to answer this one. Um, the question was around how do we um, deal with the issues when we have a difference of opinion around um, whether people should know about their diagnosis. So I think one of the questions was, you know, there's often situations where um, family members and carers may have difference of opinions and how do we manage those situations because they can be really difficult. Thanks for that and it's a really important question isn't it and let me start by saying this isn't just a question in friends and family of people with learning disability this is something that people argue about up and down the land and around the world. So first of all, there isn't a one size fits all answer that actually what we're trying to do is the best thing to help this individual. And of course, all of the people who think they should be told think that's the best thing. And all of the people who think they shouldn't be told think that's the best thing. So everybody is operating out of kindness. So that's the first thing that actually if what we do is rush to make a decision, then we rush people through thinking it through. So let's start with the person. The person may not be feeling well and they may be wondering why they're not feeling well and it's really important we don't tell any lies. So we can perhaps agree not to give reassurances that we can't follow through with like promising that the person will get better or promising that the person will never need to go into hospital. But we might be able to say things like I understand that this is worrying for you. What are you worrying about? Now, sometimes people actually raise the idea that they might be so sick that they're going to die. And if that's already going through their mind, then 
the kind thing to do is to sit with them and explore the worry rather than telling them, yes, they're right or no, they're wrong. What is it about that that's worrying you? Because it might not be dying. It might be being separated from my family. It might be not being able to stay at home. It might be somebody who might want to give me injections or I can't be with my dog anymore. It's so varied. And I would give exactly this advice whether the person who is the patient have learning disability or not. That this is about gently, gradually, over time, helping ourselves to understand what their concerns are and then answering their questions about their concerns. And actually, to know that I'm so sick that I might die and that the people I love best can be with me while that's happening because they understand that too, can be immensely reassuring. There are people who worry that they're going to die and nobody around me seems to realise that I'm going to die and I might be on my own when it happens. So keeping it simple, asking questions, answering the questions as they arise, as honestly as we can, and giving opportunities for those questions instead of being so busy and talking all of the time so they can't ask their questions is really important. And then we've got to judge it out of love for them. And but I think the thing that's coming out of this webinar today is that everybody is motivated by compassion and kindness. And in that, there also needs to be fairness about listening to both sides of the discussion about what should be told. Usually it's better to tell. Sometimes there may be exceptional circumstances where that isn't the best thing to do. I wonder whether Irene has got anything to add to that or whether you want to disagree or modify. Myself. Anastasia, you need to move over to Irena. Uh, sorry, my, my, my mouse is not listening to me. I've got a mouse who says I want to unmute myself, but it's not listening. Oh, yeah. So I was just saying, Catherine, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, it, absolutely, people are so motivated by kindness and so worried that if this person and, and if it's, I mean, I am talking now about people with with a learning disability to whom who they worry they won't understand, you know, and, and if we tell them they're going to be so upset and so, so distressed and the world is going to fall apart. In my experience, people with a learning disability are really you know, no less able than any of us, if not more, to to really cope with with, with that sort of knowledge. And and the thing is that people who are very ill and and coming towards the end of their lives, their body is telling them that they're not well. So if you're saying, oh, yeah, you'll be up, you'll get you up in no time. It will be absolutely fine. Then that doesn't match with what they are feeling. And so often I hear people being jollied along and wanting to try and, you know, make them feel happy. And, and But actually what you're doing is distressing them because what you're saying is not matching with what they're feeling. Um, so I think, you know, it's the same when, when somebody with a learning disability has an imminent bereavement happening. Do we tell them that mom is going to die? Um, you know, I think if, if you don't, then people are going to face an unexpected loss or be even more distressed. I, I, yeah, you have to be gentle and, and also really understand why families and carers ask what they're worried about, um, because they may well be very genuine. They may, it may be that some people find it hard to cope, but generally simple and truthful is what I'd say. So thank you, whoever asked those questions, thank you. It's such a good question and probably the one that I get asked most often, I have to say. So, Louise, we probably have time for one more question. It's a quick one. Well, if anything, then be quick. Hi, yes. OK, so there's a, there's a couple more um, questions come in. I think one of the things that is is people are struggling with is how do you how do you do this advanced care planning and conversation with people who may not have that great communication abilities? And I think that's something that everyone struggles with for people that have um, mild, uh, moderate learning disabilities and may have that verbal communication and abilities. Um, that's easier, but for people who don't have that, um, that's really hard. So, so yeah, Irena, do you want to answer that one? 
Um, I, I can, and actually the person who could really answer that is Jean, who you saw earlier and speaking about her daughter, daughter Victoria, because, I mean, I think an example like that, where you can really see how, how they did that, because Victoria absolutely couldn't say. She had no speech, she had no understanding, sort of, you know, intellectually about what might happen. So it's to do, I mean, advanced care planning, and if, so, if somebody can't tell you, is to do with really trying to know what they would choose if you were in their shoes, what is what they would want and what they would choose if they had all the facts. So what they did was they got, um, as Jean saw, as her circle of support around her, which was her family, some support staff who knew her really well, people who loved her, some family friends. It could be your GP who's known people with profound disabilities for decades sometimes, really has their best interests at heart. And together you think through, you know, would as it did with Victoria, with her if going back into forwards into hospital, it was, you know, she wouldn't understand why she'd had to go for your dialysis twice a week into hospital. It would be torture twice a week, and and it would be just, you know, it's not something that that they wanted to um, her to have. Um, so it is difficult, and and you really have to do this together. But I think what was interesting was also her saying that because they, it wasn't just the family who said this is what Victoria wants, no more hospitals. It was a group of people, and that's why the social services were actually very happy to support that um, because they knew it wasn't a decision taken thoughtfully and really with that person's best interest at heart. So, can you? Louise, I'm just, we've got about one or two more minutes for questions, but maybe you can sort of sum up on some of the other things that have come up. I can see there are questions coming up also up about the DNCP do not resuscitate. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's, an, and Elora has um, confirmed, um, I think there were some questions around Elora's um, comment around whether DNA CPR was legal, um, but I know Elora's been online and she's actually put some comments back on there, so so um, that should have clarified that for people. Um, I think one of the other themes that's come through is around how we um, involve palliative care colleagues at, at, at an earlier stage, um, because if people aren't imminently dying and symptomatic, then sometimes those referrals are, are not seen as appropriate, where Whereas we're, what we're saying is we want people to get involved earlier. And I think that's one of the areas that's come up. Mm. I'm going to give that final word to Catherine then as a palliative care consultant. I know you're retired, but you probably still can answer that question um, better than I can. And you're still on mute. I hope that your mouse is listening to you. It wasn't listening to me. <laughs> So, so Louise, I might need you just to nod because I can see you and I'm not sure everybody else can. Is the question about reluctance to refer early to palliative care or reluctance of palliative care teams to engage early? OK, and that's part of the, the learning disability education journey, isn't it? That actually, as somebody who's worked with people with learning disability, I've heard this before a lot of times and that's what's so fantastic about having a palliative care for people's learning disability network and I know that we've got several palliative care colleagues uh, on this webinar. Uh, hi Joe, I've seen you in the chat and this is a really really important thing that we're always striving to get early referrals from physicians and surgeons and paediatricians and that's because it takes a while to establish a relationship and a rapport and an understanding of symptoms and aspirations for good living over the last part of life. That's a much more complicated journey for people with any kind of cognitive difficulty, whether that's a learning disability or whether it's cognitive changes due to illness or dementia later on in life, where we really need to be partners within the caring team. I wonder whether we need to think about the model and whether in fact learning disabilities teams might want to think about having uh, a, an extended member of their team who is a palliative care practitioner in their local palliative care services. So instead of it being, oh, we need to find a palliative care person now for this particular person we look after, it's that there's regular input of palliative care into a learning disability team and a natural ear to listen, advice to give to steer and eventually the face to face um, meeting with a person and their supporters that evolves over time. So maybe we both need to think about our models of care to improve this. 
Okay. Thank you so much. I think that's probably all we have time for in terms of questions, but I couldn't agree more, Catherine. I think um, if, if there's one thing you take away from this webinar, um, when you know when you go away, if it's, it's networking, we're a network, so do network. If you are a learning disability service provider, see if you can find your local people who provide palliative care and you know, talk to them in the community teams so that you don't have to wait for an emergency to come up before you do that. So I'm going to just introduce you to the final short video clip that is our very own Pat and Peter, um, who I asked on Zoom because probably like a month ago now what the lockdown has been like for you. So they are our last speakers with experience before we finish. I was worried about uh, because about a very long time ago about it must be about 40 years now I had a really really bad breakdown very very bad I was in the hospital for nine months uh, and that was a really really bad time and I thought if I'm in lockdown if I can't go out at all then I was worried for, for my mental health, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm quite surprised actually, because I thought that it would be, me, I would have a really, really hard time, um, but it happened. Um, and, you know, it's not been a bad experience for me really. I miss face-to-face -face contact because even though I do like, Zoom and I like Microsoft Teams and I like Skype and stuff like that. Um, it's much better face to face, you know, the human contact really. I'm very, I like human contact. You know, yeah. Um, oh, but me, I, I don't like staying inside, I, I like going out. And um, it, and also partly when the shops, but, 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 but with most of with most of the shops shut, um, you couldn't could do that. Um, so I do um, when a positive side was it? When a positive side was it not 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 a lot of traffic about, yeah, and um. And, 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 the air, and, the, and the air is clean as well. And, and, you're not breathing, and you're not breathing on all these fumes. Oh, thank you, Pat and Peter, and um, particularly Pat for telling you your, your, your personal um, you know, story, and Peter for saying how there's been good things as well as bad things. And I think you know, listening to you all, all of you with, you know, the experts with experience, um, you know, makes me think really how much we've, it's been a common experience, we've been in it together and it's just so good to keep talking. And like you, Pat, I really like human contact, so I'm with you on that one. I'm just glad it's not the same, is it, on, on, on video link, but it's better than nothing, I suppose. So just before we finish, I wanted to just spend five minutes or so talking to you about the PCPLD network. We are a very small charity. We became a charity in 2017, but it was set up just over two decades ago, really because there was a problem with people with learning disabilities not getting the right care at the end of life. And it was something about, you know, those who worked in palliative care services were saying, oh, we can't do that. We know nothing about learning disability. They know about that. And the people in learning disability services said, oh, you know, we don't know about dying. We can't do this. They don't. Everybody thought there was an expert out, about, out there who knew everything. Well, let me tell you, there is no such expert. The only way forward is really to talk to each other and to learn from each other and to do it together. And our aims haven't really changed during the last two decades. Um, so they are to raise awareness, to share and promote best practice and to enhance collaboration. And we do this in several ways. 
we share relevant information and resources on our website. Uh, we give an award for best practice and that's named after Linda Meckenhill, who set up the PCPLD network in 1998. And it's awarded every two years now. We've had to cancel this year because of coronavirus, but the nominations will open again early next year. And here are some of our previous winners, many of whom actually have become champions and beacons of excellence. In fact, Jean um, and her daughter Victoria are part of those winning uh, teams. So do have a look at this and think about nominating a person or a team or an organisation so we can learn from the good things that you've been doing. And we also hold conferences and this is actually what today should have looked like. Um, we planned to meet in Cardiff in Wales. But today, perhaps this is a new opportunity for us. I can see there are um, not quite 2,000. Some people might watch it on catch up, but there are, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people watching this webinar now. Um, so that's good. We could be joined by so many of you. And we are a membership organisation and membership is free. So if you want to join, then email info at pcpld.org. I'm going to talk to you about money. We have no source of income um, and we're actually very grateful to have just received two grants from the, from the Bailey Thomas Charitable Trust and from Fund and also from the Coronavirus Community Support Fund, which is distributed by the National Lottery Community Fund. And that's really helping us to host events like this, even this webinar. Because, but almost, almost all of us are volunteers and it does cost money to keep the website and the social media up to date. And given the success of this webinar, I can already see in the in the box and, and on Twitter requests coming in for us to do them more regularly. So if you are able to give us a donation, however small, we would be really grateful. Big ones are good too. If you would like to have a certificate of attendance for this webinar, then please, we ask you, could you please give us a don donation, even if it's just something very tiny, um, and then email us your full name so that we can then email you your personal certificate. I want to end by saying again a huge thank you to our speakers, Catherine, Elora, Gavin, Richard, Sam, Vince, Peter and Pat, and also Louise and Jean. And thank you to our trustees and our specialist advisors who have worked together really hard to organise this webinar. But I want to say a particularly huge thank you to Kingston University in London, who have very generously supported the technical side of hosting this webinar and the joint faculty of, of um, health, social care and education where our work has been so supportive. I'm really grateful to them for allowing me to spend time in, uh, on this, so thank you. I'm also going to single out Anastasia who has worked hard behind the scenes. I know you've been sweating Anastasia and, and worrying, but it's, um, well, uh, it looks to me like it's gone really well. I mean, I'm glad you're, you're with us and continue to work with us in the future. And then finally, it's a goodbye of sorts from me because this webinar is the last do I think, thing I do as chair of the PCPLD network. I'm going to remain active on the board, so I'm not going to go anywhere, but I'm handing over the position of chair to one of our other trustees, and that's Gemma, uh, Gemma Allen. She works at the Mary Stevens Hospice in the West Midlands and where she is diversity and inclusion lead. And Gemma, you've been an inspirational champion. Um, if you're on Twitter, actually, you've probably met Gemma already because she's there. She's been tweeting away this uh, the whole through the webinar. I'm just delighted, Gemma, to leave the network in such safe hands. So welcome as the new chair of the PCPLD network. And I'm going to give you the very final word. Thank you, Marina. Um, and speaking on behalf of PCPLD network and the board of trustees, I'd like to thank you for your passion and dedication to the network. Um, in particular, as standing back as interim chair for the last 18 months. Um, we really appreciate it and we're extremely delighted that you're staying on the Board of Trustees with us. Um, I feel really privileged to be um, appointed as new chair of PCPLD Network um, and all the hard work that's gone in behind the scenes today um, and everybody that's joined, thank you so very, very much. An exciting time for the network um, and I really do feel that the next 12 months um, we can grow with what we do with our online events um, and hopefully at some point we will all be able to meet face to face at our conference. Speaking of our conferences, um, we usually end with an art space performance by people with learning disabilities and this is no different today. So please stay for the next couple of minutes um, 
on the 30th of April, Large Canada um, launched a 24 hour challenge. Um, so they received submissions from all over the world and collaborated to put together this beautiful song called Tiny Lights from their Choir of Hope. So I hope you enjoy it. And once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Wonderful. Thank you to Lash in, up in Canada and all over the world. And thank you to all of you, hundreds of you joining us today. Let's keep the conversations going. Thank you. Yeah.